the morning there, 9.30? 9.31, my friend. All right. Good for you. A little early. Yeah. For, for, for uh, COVID, it's very early. <laughs> COVID time. This is uh, mm. my sleep pattern is so messed up now. It's just not even funny. It's crazy. It says my four year olds. Oh my God. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. All right. Mm -hmm. We've already got 20 something people that jumped in. We haven't even started yet. It's scary. Absolutely What's scary. Wirecast? What is that? Uh, so LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn created their own. It's, oh, it's what they use for live case. Got it. Yeah, okay. for what we're doing. So it's a LinkedIn thing, which means the technology is absolute shit, as you would expect. <laughs> absolute, yep. just horse crap. <laughs> but hey, that's what that's why I, that's why I do these from my daughter's bedroom because that's where the router is. And that's the only way I can. Uh, Man, you've been staying home, home, huh? Yeah, and I've been good. So we are live. Yay! Even better. All right, folks. Um, Glad you were able to join us. Um, I'm wearing a hat because I have massive bedhead right now, mm. and I and I need a haircut desperately. Let's see. Um, oh yeah. So everybody, I love you. There you go. Come on. This is gorgeous. I stayed up and watched the draft last night. I should do the whole show with my hat off. Yeah. Because it is that beautiful. I'm proud. You got a nice head right of hair there. there. I have a nice head of hair with one spot that doesn't want to cooperate. Good morning, Corey LeBlanc. Good to have you on. Hello, everybody. Smack the like button, smack all those emojis, smack mm. John. That'll be happy. Hopefully um, there's a poop emoji. <laughs> there is not, man. No. I'm so, well, it's LinkedIn. You know, bless their hearts. They want to do it. Um, we've got a lot to cover. So, folks, if you don't mind, I know folks are dialing in, but I want to jump right in. So, one, in the comments section, ask questions. Um, please ask questions. And um, let us know what part of the world you're in. Uh, we love seeing that. John, we've had folks from Pakistan, Nigeria, Ghana, Ireland. Istanbul, rather crazy. I'm jumping awesome. on this. So here we go. Good morning, folks. Welcome to the 18th, I believe the 18th episode of Fintech Insider, The Breakfast Show. Show from the folks from 11 S, bringing you interesting insights into the fintech and banking landscape. I am Sam Mall, 11 S Managing Director of North America. I'll be the host for the show today. Let us know where you're watching from. We'd love to hear from where our viewers are based. As always, ask questions and share the live stream to those that aren't watching it. Please do share. Um, some of you have been great about sharing this with your friends, and uh, the audience continues to build, and we appreciate it. Today, we're very happy. <laughs> I didn't write this script. Today, I'm okay to be joined by John Walsh, the Chief Innovation Officer at Casasa in Austin, Texas. Today's show, we'll be talking about how you best motivate your teams in time of crisis, um, some shenanigans going on at the FDIC, and how you support community banks and small businesses. John, welcome to the show, but before we dive in, let's talk about the important stuff uh, your wife, Brooke, has a company called Swoovy. Yes, she does. Which she co-founded. So let's get that out of the way. What is Swoovy? And your wife is brilliant. Thank you. Uh, awesome. Swoovy is a, um, it's a simple uh, app that allows you to, uh, actually, it allows two different things. The one you're getting at is that it started as a dating app where the dates are centered around nonprofit events. So, um, so I'm going to meet somebody through the app and then our dates will be helping out the local uh, Meals on Wheels or, um, uh, you know, some nonprofit event. The uh, additional functionality that you just added actually is for couples. So if you're oh. married and uh, uh, like we are, obviously, and we love doing nonprofit you know, things together to volunteer, uh, you could choose a volunteer date and go out on a date with each other. Uh, that might be something that maybe you typically wouldn't normally do. So that's Swoovy. It's based here in Austin right now, and they're looking to expand other markets. Thanks for asking. So uh, just for our listeners, John, definitely married up. I know that's yes. a U.S. terminology, but oh, my God, it is so true because I know Thank John. Um, so Brooke <laughs> would much rather have you on the show right now, but we're stuck with John. So John, <laughs> uh, Kasasa, if you don't mind, kind of talk yeah. us through. One, what your role is at Kasasa and what, what Kasasa does. Sure, super simple. Um, Kasasa, <clears throat> my role is Chief Innovation Officer, which effectively uh, is doesn't mean anything to anybody these days. Uh, <laughs> what, it, what it means uh, at Kasasa is I, I run the, uh, I'm in charge of the products and the management of the products and the R&D. Um, Kasasa itself is a fintech company. We've been around since about 2004, I believe. And what we do is we help community banks and credit unions compete uh, specifically by 
researching products and services that uh, consumers want and either developing those products ourselves or packaging products from uh, other vendors and distribute those products through a network of institutions under a brand called Casasa. So um, uh, we've, you've seen, if you've ever been paid a high rate of interest on your checking <clears throat> for doing certain things during the month, we invented that <clears throat> back in 2004. Sure. And, um, and, and most recently we completely changed the game with, with loans. Uh, by uh, creating a feature called takebacks that allows somebody to pay ahead on their loan and then take that extra money back um, should they need it over time, penalty free. So uh, uh, that's another sort of neat product that we've done. We've had many, many other innovations in between. So um, for, because uh, by the way, we have folks from London and Egypt, uh, Mustafa from Egypt, man. Please ask a question. I love that you're- Go on. Egypt. Go Egypt. I wish I could go to Egypt right now. Um, I would love to. Do me a favor uh, for those that are overseas, and even the, the folks that are tuned in the US, um, kind of give them, a, if you don't mind, an overview of the size of the community bank population and credit union population sure. in the US, because it's massive. Yeah, um, so F, uh, financial, as far as the number of institutions, community banks number about 4,400 here in the United States and uh, credit unions are about the same, maybe around 4,000 credit unions. So in total, we're talking about 8,500 uh, community banks and credit unions. They merge or um, get acquired at the rate of about 1.25 to one and a half a day. Uh, so, you know, the numbers are, are dwindling. Uh, it, it is uh, uh, quite, you know, it's, it's a little unique to see that many institutions in one country. However, there's um, you know there's variations of community banks and credit unions all all over the world, uh, uh, but um, we do primarily help with we we only serve community institutions. Um, I think that answered your question. Yeah. So Derek Sutton from Auto Books, who was on I think last week or the week before, said Take Backs is one of the best product features released in fintech in the past several years. Doesn't get enough attention, in my Thank humble you. opinion, and that's great because that coming from another fintech company. Um, in auto books, so <clears throat> praise uh, from the market. So Thank here's you. here's why I wanted to set the scene with the number. Here's what's so important: these these eight thousand roughly community banks and credit unions, their IT budget, their innovation budget, their their ability to develop products um, against God. Forget the top hundred banks. Let's take the top two hundred and fifty banks in the U.S. Yeah, it's not even in the same ballpark. This is the equivalent of. Um, in England, this would be the equivalent of a Wednesday night or a Sunday league of people that look like me playing soccer, trying to take on Man United. I mean, that's just reality when it comes to state. In the U.S., it's, oh, my God, Pee Wee. I was going to say Pee Wee football. Pee Wee football trying to take on the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, the budgets are ridiculous yeah. when you compare the two. So their reliance upon, and, and Corey LeBlanc is, is giving me high fives right now in Louisiana. Their ability to compete when it comes to the products they can offer um, is is highly dependent upon third party providers like yourself, right? Yes. Yeah, we work with about 900 uh, community banks and credit unions uh, around the United States, and you know, primarily they rely on companies like us to either help them, you know, figure out the marketplace from the standpoint of what a consumers actually want, uh, technology, R and D development, uh, you know, the the understanding of their own data, because oftentimes most community institutions sit on a web of, um, well, you know this at 11FS, sit on a, a spaghetti of, um, of providers that are oftentimes even owned by one major company. But for some reason, all of those different vendors don't talk to each other, even though they're all owned by the same company. And as a result, it's very difficult for a community bank or a credit union to even know their their own business very well, to yeah. know, you know, whether it's BI tools or just understanding what it costs to acquire an account or to maintain an account. Those types of very simple business metrics are, um, are exceptionally challenging, if not impossible, for most community institutions to figure out on their own. Yeah, I mean, um I'll, I'll just run through a couple examples of this. We, you guys, at this point, have to be tired of me talking about Jill Castillo, and I don't care. Mm -hmm. So, at Jill's bank in Oklahoma, she has 55 people total, right? Um, uh, I, I mean, most IT departments, you know, for these banks that are under, say, two and a half billion um, in assets, yes, four or five people, and they're there to keep the lights on. 
right? Yeah. I mean, that's reality. So they don't have the resources that, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. In 2008, um, when the crash happened, um, and the years after that, city went out and hired a ton of compliance officers. At one point, they had 30,000 compliance officers. Oh, wow. 30,000 compliance. I mean, just think about that, right? I mean, their their ability, their spend, it's just, I like what Dan said from London. This is David versus poor Goliath. It's actually David versus about 150 Goliaths, to be honest. Um, so there's actually something going on that I want to spend some time on because um, we had this as a story, but uh, John definitely raised the seriousness of it. So we want to talk about it. This is one that probably most of you haven't heard about um, or, or, or even noticed. So um, there's a new ruling proposal that's coming out from the FDIC here in the U.S. Uh, focused on community and it's really focused on this relationship between the service providers and community banks. Um, and it's going to affect their ability to compete with what I just talked about. Yeah. And and Casas has kind of been at the forefront of, of this, of trying to educate folks in Washington, D.C. So, John, I'm going to hand this over to you for a minute. Uh, yeah. What exactly am I talking about? What's the impact? Yeah, for sure. Um, I'll do my best. I mean, obviously, there's people at Casasa who have been spending almost years on this stuff uh, and a good chunk of their lives on this. Um, so the, 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 the part that matters the most is this proposed ruling that uh, initially came about the middle of December last year. And, um, and specifically, there's a comment period that's happening right now where the FDIC is asking uh, banks in particular and third party providers uh, to comment on this proposed ruling by, uh, I want to say it's, yeah, by the first week of June, June 9th. Yeah, 60 so days comment period. Is yeah, they extended a little bit due to the COVID thing. And also in March, they kind of clarified a little bit of what they, uh, what they had, had said that they meant. But, um, but there's it, it, the time to act is right now. So I'll preface it that way. Um, so Yelena McWilliams is, uh, um, you know, she's, she's been very vocal over the last year. Chairman of the FDIC. So sorry. Yes, yeah. Chairman of FDIC has been very vocal about the importance of community banking and how community banks need to uh, use third-party providers to um, to compete, to be more efficient, to offer new technologies and authentication services, and all of the things that you can imagine that community banks just can't build on their own. So she, the chairwoman, has been exceptionally vocal about. Um, how important community banks are to the infrastructure of the United States, and and as well to uh, and and how their third party providers are 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 extremely important. And the proposed ruling, there was some some maybe some misunderstanding, but the proposed uh, rule is pretty impactful to almost anybody who works with community banks on the third party side to community banks themselves and as well to consumers. And the rule is essentially if you are a third party vendor who works with community banks who in, in, in many, many different capacities from data augmentation to artificial intelligence to database marketing to if you're just a marketing service to if you're a consulting service um, you know, helping an institution with figuring out their price elasticity studies or, you know, literally name your data source that needs to provide data to an to a, a bank, uh, you will be deemed a deposit broker. And um, just to clarify, I think most people on, on LinkedIn probably, or at least on this, would know what a deposit broker is. But, you know, the broker deposit um, idea is not necessarily super negative. A lot of banks will use broker deposits short term, um, uh, but they, they they got certainly a, neg a negative stigma back in the 80s when um, when, you know, so broker deposits, they're, they're like aggregated consumer funds that are managed by a third party. All right. And what happens is banks will effectively buy those to grow their, their, their the size of their bank. And, um, and all of that is well and good, presuming that the, the bank is acting in the best interests of uh, the FDIC and you know, the insurance, uh, as well as uh, the, um, uh, their, their people who actually bank there. Um, but, but what happened during the 80s is these, um, uh, these deposit brokers were shifting the funds 
whenever they noticed like a, uh, a bank during the SNL crisis was starting to get a little, uh, starting to have some challenges, they would pull all these deposits from that bank and it would cause the bank to collapse. And uh, I mean, amongst other things, but that was a, a huge issue with the liquidity uh, related to that bank. And so, so out of that SNL crisis, the eighties, the FDIC, perhaps rightfully determined that deposit uh, that broker deposits would come with additional fees and and banks would need to track those broker deposits and the source of the, that money very differently than uh, than deposits that just come in through the branch or through the online channel directly to the to the bank well uh, that that um, broker deposit designation which would relate to you if you were a marketing service working with an institution, perhaps on marketing their, uh, their checking accounts, or if you were a data mining service helping out an institution with you know, uh, data related to checking accounts, or if you perform SEO. Uh, I mean, the list is on and on and on. Um, uh, uh, what that means is that now the bank has to pay higher fees for the deposits that come in related to your efforts, which is who knows how the hell to track that. Um, and then as well, of course, your, uh, um, uh, you know, what, what fundamentally that means is the bank itself is just not going to use you as a third party. So now that means the bank now has much less data access availability that, that it was using to make decisions, uh, perhaps has uh, very, very limited, perhaps none, uh, uh, no use of any sort of R&D from all the fintech companies out there that are trying to help them out. Um, and then from a consumer standpoint, it means that we're talking about increased fees on deposits, uh, severe, uh, severely decreased rates that or yields that, that might be paid on those deposits. Um, community banks themselves, of course, are going to be stop offering most fintech products and services and could ultimately lead to these institutions closing their doors a heck of a lot faster than maybe they, they would otherwise. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I said this on a show, it might've been yesterday, the day before, but um, one thing that we're seeing, when we came out of 2008 in the market, in the, in the crash that we had there, there was all this talk about switching your bank and folks leaving these, you know, the top banks um, and, and maybe moving into community banks. And actually yeah. during this time, we're hearing a ton of talk about, because the community banks are doing a tremendous job on these small business loans. This PPP yes, they program are. That we talk, I mean, like, tremendous, the, the volume that they're pushing through with limited staff is incredible. That's, and we'll talk about PPP in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, but what's actually going on though, when you take a step back and um, in first quarter of 2020, over a trillion dollars in deposits was taken. Um, within financial institutions in the U.S., and roughly 40% of that went to the top four banks. 40% yep. with the four banks. We talked about the difference in scale and size and ability to compete. Let that just sink in. I mean, what we're moving to is, you know, I'll, here's what's coming out of COVID right now. This is Sam Mall's opinion. Um, the bigger just getting bigger. Amazon, Walmart, Target, their numbers when with their reporting, especially on the online side, is tremendous. They're killing it. Um, you know, the idea of these, what we're going to see a massive impact on are these small businesses, you know, uh, if you live in New York, Toronto, if you're in Austin, I can only imagine the hit that the, the you know, the small businesses in Austin are taking right now. Um, it's pretty nasty. Yeah, and it's gonna be everywhere. I mean, I the, think, the effects of this are long-term. You know, if this, so a so couple of things. First of all, if the, uh, if, if you're, um, if you're at all moved by what we just talked about with the FDIC. I'll tell you, we're meeting with the FDIC on Monday. Okay, so we've, you know, we've been working as and spending a lot of money trying to engage with the, the right people to help the FDIC clarify what was clearly some sort of miscommunication at the FDIC between the chairwoman and uh, and the proposed rule. So I think I think there's already some. And, and, you know, in March, they kind of said, hey, you know, there's this isn't exactly what we meant, what we right. the proposed rule. So there's intention and, and uh, behind how do we clarify this? And we're looking to clarify it for the benefit of community banks and the people who work with them. So so that's the good news. The thing that I'm worried about is so far when I look at like the comments, the comments are primarily driven by Casasa and Casasa's clients. I'm yeah. not seeing other third parties and there's thousands of you guys out there. 
um, react. And I think the reason is just because it's not well known. And so thank you for the uh, few minutes to put on this. If you want to learn more, go to the world's worst URL. Are you ready for it? I already put it in the comments. It's, it's in the comments, everybody. Safe community banking competitors not com. The SEO on that is shit. Um, we'll leave it alone. Uh, hey, the question is: Is there is there a similar rule affecting credit unions? So a little bit of clarification. The FDIC. Um, the, there's a separate bureau that that ensures credit unions, and I just forgot the name of it. But yeah, the NCUA. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's a it's a separate government organization. So the two. Are, are are separate. Um, I don't know if there's a rule affecting them. What I to will be, say, to be frank, no, it's there's there's not. I mean, to be, okay. to be to be quite frank, the NCUA has been in a lot of ways more progressive as far as understanding huh. how how consumers behave today. Um, huh. A lot of the FDIC's regulations were, uh, and the comments to those have been, you know, are, are decades old and have not necessarily been clarified to the degree that maybe they should when you take into account things like people today search online for getting an account. People today open accounts online. Uh, and, and there are sources that you can go to find the best account for you and to find the best loan for you. And yeah. those sources as well are under this new rule going to be deemed deposit brokers. And so, so you know, there's all of this new, it's not even new, it's, De a decade old technology uh, uh, and and types of companies that uh, that the FDIC really needs to catch up with uh, to 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 help community banks because um, no credit unions are sitting pretty and I don't I don't think the NCUA is going to do it uh, I don't see why they would have any reason to change that. So here's what's interesting about all this, and I'm glad that um, uh, John really raised awareness with 11FS on this because we just had this as a question. But hadn't dove that deep into it. Um, the thing is, uh, the chair, the chairman uh, of the FDIC, Yolanda Williams, is um, actually very impressive, right? I mean, you're, she's a U.S. immigrant from, I think, Yugoslavia. Um, you know, came to the United States, barely spoke English, and, and has worked her way to oversee an institution that is. John is a fair comment. Is this fragmented? Um, <laughs> and archaic as it can be. I mean, it dates yeah. back to 1933. Um, and, and, and she has said that on stage a million times. We, we have got to get much leaner. We have to be a lot more in touch with the, the especially the community banks that we service. So David Garambino in New York asked a great question. So what's the purpose of the, what's the purpose of the rule? I mean, why did they create it? What, what kicked this off? I think, I think the purpose is, I think what they were doing is reacting to, they were trying to, in my opinion, uh, react to the archaic, sort of language that was around broker deposits. And that archaic language primarily is from the 80s, which predates uh, ex, you know, getting a, uh, checking accounts online and using sources like, you know, choose your favorite uh, source for finding a new, de new deposit checking account. Um, uh, there's, as a result, um, uh, I think they were trying to clarify that to make it easier and more. I think Yelena was trying to clarify it and make it easier for um, for banks to work with these uh, third parties. But as you all know, anybody who's ever worked in a company of any size, no matter how how efficient and how awesome your company is, sometimes communication between what um, the boss wants and what mm -hmm. other people do, uh, you know. It, it plays a telephone game or whatever, and there's there's miscommunication there. Unfortunately, in this case, this mis miscommunication is going to lead to a very powerful uh, negative impact on the banking, on on community banking, but also just banks in general in the United States. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, we had we had a couple of questions. Like, um, one, does this require congressional or Congress's approval? I don't think so. No. The FDIC. That's yeah, right. it's not. They, they set you know they set this. Um, the second is, would this affect companies like Venmo, right? Yeah. Um, or Plaid? It will, right? Will, will it not? Um, you know, I, I, the thing, I, my my the thing is about all of these proposed rules is there, or, or even rules, oftentimes are not as clear as we necessarily want them to be, and and so you know that often leads to I, I've I've heard you know I'm not going to put words in Yellen's mouth, but I've heard to the degree of some members of the FDIC saying that often leads to decisions down below people who are doing the auditing for instance 
making their own decisions based upon sort of one-off use cases. And so I don't, I don't want to say who necessarily it will impact. I'll just tell you the types of groups. And yeah, many, many types of groups like the any sort of fintech provider you can think of in the United States are impacted. And, and this, that's, yeah. that's a big deal. This isn't, and this isn't unique, folks. Uh, for those that aren't in the U.S., um, are most often from Egypt, right? Uh, folks in London. This isn't anything new. And I know you go through the same thing with the OOC in the U.K. I'm sure everybody does this uh, with government um, agencies. I mean, I remember when I um, was first working in the prepaid space, right? Prepaid was an evil word, remember? I mean, oh, my God, I mean, the damn Kardashian card and everything else that was there. Um, yeah, the rush card. The rush card was awesome. Rush card. And, then, hey. and then, it, then it went downhill. Yeah, and then it wasn't. Um, but yeah, I mean, the the amount of education and the amount of discussions that you have to have, not only in DC, but with your state regulators, right? Um, it, this goes across the piece. That's something we have to spend a ton of time on. I like what Derek Sutton said. National versus local regulations is a big problem in banking. Little to no continuity. Amen. I mean, that's one of the challenges for any of you. So Monzo, um, we talk about Monzo a lot, 11FS. Monzo is going to seek their banking license in the U.S. And, you know, we keep telling her, you know, my, my feedback constantly is, I love you, Monzo, as a company. The U.S., you're dealing with 50 states, you know, that are completely, it's just so disjointed in the U.S., you know. And as John, you, you run a company that's been around for 16 years. I mean, you know this. Uh this, I think the technical phrase is this shit ain't easy. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not easy. It's, but it's, but it's, uh, it, it's important work that any, anyone yeah. who's in our industry working with, in my opinion, community banks and uh, community institutions in general, we're doing really, really important work because the work they do is exceptionally powerful. I mean, you mentioned Jill earlier. There's no doubt. I mean, um, you know, stuff that she's doing is, you know, leads the industry. Um, yeah. and it's fun. It's, it's just fun to, to, to watch her on LinkedIn or, you know, just engage with her, uh, uh, through social media, um, and get inspired by what she's doing. But there are so countless other community banks and credit unions that, do, that, that are, that are literally on the front lines today, putting themselves, uh, in danger to help small businesses get back on their feet. And that's, I mean, it's super powerful. And if you can get excited about things like that, then, um, you know, then, then you know that the work you do to help out those institutions and help them be more efficient or help them reach other businesses or, or consumers um, is, uh, uh, you know, it's, um, it's, it's impactful in so many ways. It's just, it's, uh, it's incredible to be a part of. Yeah, I don't think we realize we get caught up in these macro stories, right? Um, and it's, it's the nature of the beast. Um, yeah. But, I mean, the reality is even when it comes to politics, right, regardless of what side of the aisle you fall on, if you really want to impact people's lives, it's your local government that has a significant, I mean, it just is, right, it's significant yep. impact, and it tends to get ignored. Um, and I don't care where you live in the world, that's true. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the same from the regulatory side. It's the same with, um, we need we need community banks. We need yeah. credit unions. You know, I I. I have good friends and I have worked with the largest banks in the world and I'm fine with them too. Right. But we need the mix. We need the blend. Um, we don't need to fall into a, into a world where basically a, uh, a monopoly is controlling everything. And I think most of us aren't dumb enough to realize that um, I don't care what industry you look at. We're pretty much falling into that little, uh, uh, we're, we're becoming every futuristic Disney movie. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as we ride around in the chairs, right? Uh, that, that's when we know it's over. <laughs> Not funny. Not funny, but so true. Yeah, it is. Uh, so, John, uh, we just spent 30 minutes talking um, about uh, a regulatory proposal. I love that. And it was actually fun. And Thank we you. didn't we didn't cut into each other, which we normally do. So the next time I, I see you in Austin, we will rip each other for a good four hours because that's Sounds what John good. and I normally do. Best place for people. We Like I said, I put the link on that small community banking thing. Please take a look, reach out to John. Let's Please get a do. mini groundswell going. What's the best place to learn more about Kasasa and engage with you, John? Uh, Kasasa.com and engage with me. Uh, it's really simple. Just use at my last name, 
Twitter. So at WAPSH, W-A-U-P-S-H. Sam All, I want to thank you so much for actually saying my name correctly today after about 10 first years time. of knowing each other. This first, is time. first time. First time. And, and folks, just so you know, I do it wrong on purpose just to piss them off and it makes me laugh. Um, we, we spend hours over drinks of me trying to pronounce his last name and uh, Eddie hasn't physically assaulted me over the years. I haven't, I, I've never drank for an hour in my life. So I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, that is such bullshit. Everybody, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Next week's uh, lineup is rather sick. That's all I'll say. We'll be publishing it shortly. Um, thank you all for being part of this. We really enjoy the the interaction we have with the folks and the questions you ask. Please share this with your friends. Um, we really appreciate it. John, thanks for being on. Everybody, we'll see you next week.